Greetings, Moonlight Citizens. This is your Moonlight King here to bring you episode Moonlight Kingdom podcast episode 33, the strangely horror and sci fi focused episode right here on Moonlight Kingdom podcast. Earth getting into it in three, two, one, boom. True Detective, Mahershala Ali basically carried that show on his back, but it was like so far removed from like season one. It was like, yeah, I get you're trying to go back to basics, but like the basics was so long ago, like we don't, you know, we've kind of moved on from that. But yeah, yeah, yeah we have. And <clears throat> what they, what honestly, it's that uh, Nick created a universe where these kinds of things are normal where, you know, there's esoteric elements and there's entities from another world that are, like, giving power and influence to people. So you could have set up, like, another state where this was happening, you know, or maybe something a bit more, like, upscaled, where it's not, you're not in the deep south with a bunch of hillbillies, you're, like, in the suburbs or, like, the deep suburbs of New York, where oh. you're trying to find, like, trying to regrets together you mean like when in season two when the whole show moved to la and we had three protagonists instead of two and they were doing the same shit that was going on in like season one but it's in la now with all their cults and weirdo religions and drugs and shit yeah but la is lame i find la to be so lame you know of course there's weirdo shit it does it's not I want it to be linked in some way to the weird cult that was happening in the South. To see, like, it's not just one senator that was participating and worshipping this entity. It was, like, multiple people. Would you say... Is that simply what they did? What? And season two? That is what they did. They moved to L.A. They had three different protagonists instead of just two. One of them was Vince Vaughn. And the other was Colin Farrell, and the third one was, I think, Amy Adams. I don't remember for sure, but, like, yeah. That's a weird costume choice. But yeah, anyways. like, they were all cops. They were all investigating, like, separate... No, 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 Vince Vaughn wasn't a cop. He was a casino owner, and they all somehow wound up in, entangled in this weird shit. So, like, it all culminated in the end. But like, you know, like, oh, Taylor Kitsch. It's actually four protagonists. I forgot about Taylor Kitsch. Well, then again, Hollywood also forgot about Taylor Kitsch. That's neither here nor there. So it's actually four main characters. Three of them are cops. One of them's a casino owner, played by Vince Vaughn. And it's like, yeah, it's moved to L.A. with all their cults and their weird shit and drugs and whatever. It's honestly, it felt more like training day at times than it did like it didn't feel like it was set in the world of true detective it felt like characters from true detective found themselves in the same world as training day if that makes sense <laughs> that's an interesting framing to put it in yeah i mean it kind of did it had its moments you know um thing is with two leads you can spend a lot of time focusing on who they are like the stuff they do when they're not, you know, focused on one case, and you get to see how effective they are at their job when they are focused on one case, the effect the the job has on them over the years, you can do that. But when you got to divide time between four main characters and the villain, it's like, yo, where's, where are we going to get all the time to do this? Like, there's no... I don't know, they kind of fall into cliches yes. almost. Like, yeah, it's, it's too many cooks in the kitchen at that point, so you're not going to get anything that tastes nice or consistent. Yeah, like, plus, in it's kind of, it tries to follow the anthology format, like, oh, this season has absolutely nothing to do with the previous season, which at the time was the exact opposite of what people wanted, because they grew to love these characters, like, Russ Cole and Marty, and they wanted to see like more of them, or at the very least, more of the world that they were in. And so, to just uproot everything and move to LA, it was like right off the first episode, people were like, What the hell is this? Like, you know, that's not true, detective. That's that's whenever anybody asks me about the show, 
I said, yeah, there's only one season of True Detective. And they're like, no, no, there's four. I'm like, no, no, there's just one. I don't know what the other ones are called, but that's not True Detective. True yeah. Detective is season one, Rust and Body, and that's it. I mean, just one season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, True Detective is absolutely one of those shows that should have had just one season. Uh, if they had a movie afterwards, I would have been fine with it. Yeah, I mean, you can have a movie. Thing is, what would the movie be? Would the movie be a like the an anthology type thing where it's a totally different setting, totally different characters, or would it just be Mari and Cole later years? I would have liked to see those two cops that interrogated them do something. Oh. Uh. Or it's like they're trying to battle a legal case where they've actually found evidence of like Tuttle connected to the, the children's killer and they're trying to fight this case and it's like a fight against the system and they're like lives are in danger. I would, I would like to see that. There was kind of a thing for that in the last episode, like the very last episode towards the end when the FBI guys go to tell Marty like, yeah, we, we found you guys in that pit and we also found, they try to tell him, like, like we also found this stuff, and, like, here's what we know. He was like, stop, man, just, just stop. Like, because he was so done with all this. Like, because as far as he was concerned, the case is closed. The guy's been got, that's that. Like, he's out of it. He don't want to hear any more to do with this crap. He's just, like, you could tell, like, in, like, how tired his voice was. He wasn't just tired because he was injured. Like, he was tired of all this shit. He really wanted to be out, out. Like, like, because he was like, the way he said, like, like, stop, man. Just, no, just, just stop. Like, I'm so checked out. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that could have been that opening for another continuation of True Detective. It's like, okay, Marty and Cole are out of the picture because... They've gone as far as they are willing to go. Let's take the rest of it. Like their mother tunnels, those other dudes all over the state. Let's take them down. This could have been, I mean, if you were to do a true detective movie, it could have been that. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Present day uh, Moonlight King here to say, that is a terrible fucking idea. I just came back from, like, you know, I just saw all the cutscenes for Suicide Squad. And, you know, the video game Suicide Squad killed the Justice League. And good lord, that ending is basically just, well, we've taken down this Brainiac. And there's a bunch of other Brainiacs all across, like, the multiverse. Now let's go take them down. Like, no. That is a terrible freaking idea. That is a terrible way to end a video game. Because it basically says, hey, everything you just did, well, it, it, ain't, it doesn't amount to anything. There's still, you know, other Brainiacs out there that need to be taken down. Not only that. To do that here in True Detective would basically sell Russ and Marty, hey, know this one Tuttle that you took out? Good job on all that. But there's other Tuttles out there still doing stuff. So, yeah, all that you did, all the pain you suffered, all that torment, you know, losing your job, your marriage deteriorating, all of that was kind of for nothing because there's still plenty of other Tuttles out there to stop, and you got to go stop them. So that's a terrible idea. I'm glad they didn't do that. Now back to the show. I agree with that. Shit, oh man. Ah, good old True Detective, man. Like, just... This is... Huh. It's so interesting, though. The thing is, with season two, you think you know what to expect because you've seen True Detective 1. You actually start... Like, personally, I ask the questions like, okay... I know there's four protagonists, but, like, who's who's the Russ Cole here? Who's the Marty? But since it was, like, four different characters in separate stories until they eventually intertwined, it was like, there is no Russ Cole here. There is no Marty. There's no... The chick that Marty was banging, she's not here. We don't really... You know, those archetypes don't exist in this version of the show. So now it's essentially starting from scratch. And that's the big, like, pitfall you risk when you do an anthology series. It's like you essentially ask your audience to start over every time. 
unless it's like American Horror Story and you're keeping the same cast, they're just playing different people. I like the American Horror Story approach. It's it's just like one crew that keeps doing the same work and the same work, and it just it just works because the cast are so familiar with each other that any on screen chemistry that they have is instantaneous, and they just get stuff done. I, yeah, I was a big fan. Of, they did the haunting of Hill House and the haunting of Blind Manor. Like right? that's what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, I liked the um, yeah the the one in the eighties, the American Horror Story ones in the eighties on that camp. Like that was that was pretty entertaining to me. Like um, there there was this rumor <laughs> there was a rumor last year that there was gonna be an uh, American Horror Story. Like I'm, I know this was a joke. This was a joke that was going online, but it really did the rounds. There was a rumor that there was gonna be a American Horror Story season that had to do with Grinder, and it was gonna star James Charles and that that woman, she that Stifler's mom from the American from like American Pie movies was gonna play his mom, and I was like, what the? <laughs> Nothing like no, no. not gonna lie. Jennifer Coolidge, she's also on White Lotus. Yeah, she's had a quite a resurgence. I mean. And speaking of American Pie, she said that uh, she got laid a lot because of that movie. So, uh, yeah, moving on from that. I'd watch that. I'd watch that just to see Stiffler's mom more than anything. Like, yo, put her in American Horror Story. Like, what's she going to do? in the first 10 minutes then it's like okay I, I'll, I'm on board but like otherwise why are you here <laughs> first 30 seconds I'm not watching it uh, that's enough you'd be like Justin Bieber in that Zoolander movie like the movie opens with him dying <laughs> I haven't seen Zoolander like oh uh, dude like I you can tell right there in that movie like Ben Stiller knew like he, he knew what the people wanted to see like just like because it was right in that point where like nobody like Justin Bieber because you know you know he just dumps in a Gomez he was on his like weird like he was getting tattoos and like pissing in buckets and shit like and like Ben Stiller knew like okay like I gotta ice this dude in the first few minutes or else like people gonna riot or some shit and he gets gunned down. Like, what the hell? It was so funny, man. Like, and he gets gunned down in slow motion. Like, they want you to see this dude getting shot. <sighs> oh, man. Oh, God damn, man. Like, just the anthology format. I don't think, like, if they, had, if they did American Horror Story style format of we'll bring in Matthew McConaughey and, you know, <clears throat> All of those guys in season two, they'll just be playing different characters in a different setting. You think it would have worked? I mean, I don't, but will you? No, it wouldn't because, uh, it didn't because those characters are so solidified. Like, if you just made them play other roles, it would have been weird. Like, we don't know the range that of, of we know the range of like McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, but just. I don't think it would have worked because those two characters are so beloved. Like, although they are quite fucked up, they are like, they are some messed up motherfuckers. But, uh, yeah, it would not have worked at all. I agree. That style isn't for everything. I mean, just ask the Scream show. Like, remember that crap? They made Scream into a TV show. I heard about this. Yeah, and weirdly enough, like, Wes Craven actually directed, like, season one, and people are like, ah, this is, this is okay, it's not the movie, but it's okay, and people were apparently, though, they were up in arms that he redesigned the, the ghost face mask, and, like, honestly, it looks better, like, the redesigned mask for the TV show, it makes sense that they would be, the killer would have a new mask, because this isn't that, it's a 
like a reboot of the franchise, so they would change that. And it did look more horrific, because let's be real, the Ghostface mask is kind of goofy. Just... Yeah, the original is iconic. Yeah, but still, like, it's, I think Scary Movie, like with Marlon Wayans and them, kind of ruined the scare factor of it all. Like, just, and like, I mean, yeah, before that movie came out, like, Ghostface was intimidating, like a dude calling you up in your house, like, like the calls coming from inside your house, and then the fucking, Mar- the Wayans brothers came in, and they made that whole shit a joke, like, Oh, dude. I miss spoof movies, don't you? I haven't seen one in a while, but yeah, yeah, I do. I yeah. do miss those movies. Well, the creepy ones, especially. Yeah, yeah. There's an element to it which I just find. <laughs> I find it both yeah. funny and interesting because I'd be like, you know, me personally, I would not be in this situation. It's like the call is coming from inside your house. Well, I'm out the window. What you gonna do now? Yeah. What you gonna do now? Also, that wouldn't work today, dude. Like, we have caller ID now. So, I mean, just saying, you would know who's calling you. Like, hmm, like, imagine, like, getting called from, like, this random killer, like, like, I'm inside. The call is coming from inside your house. Just look at the phone and, like, Randy, is that you? Like, uh, no, nah, no. Nah. This, this, this ain't Randy. Is that you? <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Like, no. It's not Randy. And he just yelled, like, I have caller ID, you moron. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Dude. The killer would have to use a payphone or some shit. Like, just. You just see a guy in a phone booth somewhere. Like, like, the call is coming from five houses down. Like. <laughs> Yeah, the phone call would be coming from the phone booth, and dude would be like, "Like, I, he would lie and be some shit like, I'm in the house. So the call's coming from inside the house. Yeah. Then out of nowhere, if you'd like to continue this call, please insert five. <laughs> oh, that would be, yeah, hey, man, I should write freaking scary movies. Why don't they do that shit? Like, have... Could have had the dude call for a payphone and then the, the chick on there, like, if you'd like to make a call, please insert it 35 cents or some shit. Like, uh, uh, uh hold, hold on. <laughs> oh, shit. This, ah, this is some franchises that need to know when to end, and that's definitely one of them. Ooh. I agree. Man, like, um, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Shit, we were talking about dude. I gotta say, do you would you say Timothy Chalamet when you found out Timothy Chalamet was gonna be Paul, like did you like that casting? Yeah, I did. Really? Okay, given the fact that he pulled off the character is a big plus for me. But to be honest, he does put the stature of Paul at the moment because Paul was quite young when all this shit happened. So it and Timothy Chalamet looks like a twink, so it makes sense. What do you mean looks like he is a twink? I mean, have you seen dude yeah. like the dude's bold? Yeah, yeah, he's a twink, but he's also Paul Muadi Betrayed's. So yeah, in the sequel, I mean, like he does like big up in the sequel. You know, like he he don't look as like small as he did. Like they actually pointed it out in the first movie when um Jason Momoa's character like. What's his name? God damn. He has like the most normal Duncan. Yeah. Duncan Idaho rolls up. He's like, hey, look at you. You like you like you gave some muscle? He's like, really? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so was like, but, by the way, Duncan Idaho is the most like ordinary freaking name in this whole thing. Everybody got some wacky space name and he rolls up like I'm Duncan Idaho. Just like what the hell? It's supposed to, no, it make it makes sense in the long. Okay, it's gonna make sense in like the grand scheme. In the book, it does make sense why his name is so 
easy to pronounce and it's just normal because frankly he is the eyes for which we see the universe a lot of the time yeah Ugh. that's yeah, oh, that's mean... another thing that, that that comes up later on um there's a race of people in like the edges of the universe that become very relevant in in the dune of books and well now the movies going forward and it's the trailaxon people it sounds really it spells weird and it sounds just as weird and basically um they've learned the they have the technology to clone humans from dead cells so if they get like they get a hold of a corpse or like a piece of you and I, like a, a piece of DNA of you and I, they can fully recreate us. And the fully recreated version has our memories in him, but it's not like unlocked. Genetic memories, yeah. It's like some animus shit. Yeah. Animus, where do you think animus got it from? Ah. Yeah, yeah. Man, on the subject of movies, man, I hated that movie he did to the Animus. Like, made it this big ass claw that like came down and grabbed the dude. Like, what is this? Who's like, it? Uh, this is unnecessary. That was yeah. a change. That was like, why? Like, I saw that in the trailer, and I'm just like, why? Like, I remember, dude. Like, I was talking to, I showed the trailer to like Molly, and we were talking, and then like. He's not a gamer, but even he knows, like, like what the, he was like, what the fuck did they do that for? Like, the Animus is a bed that you lie on. I'm like, dude, exactly. Like, this fucking thing. Oh, shit, dude. Oh, but goddamn, that was such an unnecessary change. Like, thing is, I'll allow a change to the source material if it makes sense for a movie. But, like, this makes no sense. What is this? Like, uh. And that is why Ubisoft is trash. They have been trash, man. Like, what, what are you saying is, oh, they've been trash. So. Yeah, they've been trash. Uh. I can't believe this is the first movie of Ubisoft, like, film division. They launched a whole film division just to make. Uh, like Ubisoft movies based on video games, and this is the first movie, and it sucked. Ugh. Damn. I mean, that shows the quality they put into things. Yeah. Speaking of, I need to bring a very cool point um, that I learned about recently. Somebody had to like explain it to me, but basically. You know how Paul has been given this vision of the future because he is the Kuzach Hadrak, right? Yeah. So the Tleilaxu had engineered their own version of a Kuzach Hadrak. They created one. And when the Kuzach Hadrak that they made discovered his purpose and what he needed to do to save mankind, he literally killed himself because it became too much to bear. Yeah, I can, I mean, I don't condone that, but I can kind of understand being given a destiny that seems like this is too big for me. Like, yeah, you kind of see some of that in like how Paul handles the news when he, like, gets given the idea, like, you're the one, man, like, you're gonna lead us to freedom, and it's like, even in the first movie, like, he's, there's, they really focus on, like, destiny and whatnot, and he asks his dad, like, what if, you know, I can't, like, what if I'm not, like, the future of House of Trades? and, you know, his dad says the best fucking thing he could say in that moment, then you're all, you, you already are all you'll ever need to be, like, you're my son, I'm like, damn, man, like, that's a dad, that's a dad. Yes, that's a dad right there. Yeah, dad. Like, he could I love that scene. Yeah, I love that scene, but, like, if this was, like, anyone else directing this shit, he would have said some cliche shit, like, don't worry, you will be. Like, or something like that. Like, like, dude, that's not what he needs to hear right now. Like, don't do it by myself. 
Michael B. <laughs> <laughs> Shit blowing up every five minutes and shit like like uh, camera shaking all over the joint, like random shots of like like Chani's ass, even though she only shows up in like the last five minutes. Like she'd be having like flash would be having like flash shows and it'll just be Chani's ass for a second. It's like Like, he'd just be like, I know you. Like, I saw you in a dream I had. Uh, what kind of dream was that there, man? Huh? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, shit. I mean, it'd be a messed up adaptation, but it'd be funny to watch. You can't deny that. Yo, I, I'd crack up. I'd, I'd be so dead. Dude. I mean, you'd hate it after the fact, but, like, in the moment, you'd be laughing. You know you'd be laughing, man. Ugh. But he's gotten better, though. I mean, his last... Uh, ever since he's left Transformers, like, he's gotten way better. So I'm like... It just has me wondering, was Michael Bay really that bad? Or was it just, like, the franchise he was stuck in? I think the new Transformers showed that it was just a combination of both. Like, the Bumblebee movie was certainly a lot better than, you know, like, The Last night or whatever the hell they were working with. Yeah. Damn, though, man. Like, that was... I am... I'm kind of... There's a weird feeling I have with those movies because, like, a part of me is, like, at the same time, yeah, I like Bumblebee. It really reminded me of the Iron Giant in a lot of places. At the same time, it's like, you know, Michael Bay had his moments in those movies. The first three, like, definitely had their moments. Like, you know, Ken Jong going on a, like, wang, deep wang. Like, just like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and then they come out of the bathroom, and, like, because this conversation that was happening in a bathroom stall, He's like, like standing on, like dude is sitting down and he's standing on his knees and he's like expositing all this info and he pulls this file out of his pants, like gives it to him and then he steps out of the stall, like pants unbuckled and shit and like John Malkovich is like washing his hands like what the fuck was going on in there? Michael Bay moment. Dude. I like to say. 
only Michael Bay will craft something that yeah. Shane gets that moment. And so fucking whack. Like, just like, and when the, the after they discover mm-hmm. her, like, they, she's chasing them through the library, there's all this fire and destruction, and then she just, like, slowly model walks out of all the flames and shit. Like, like she's showing off a dress or something. Like, yo, what the... <laughs> just walking out of there like with all the like the flame and stuff going on in the sideways like you're just half expecting the song to kick in like she's a lady go oh, oh, she's a lady <laughs> the building's collapsed behind you know it's just I don't know man the tone of Revenge of the Fallen is freaking everywhere especially in that opening man but hey, what do you expect? That's what you get when you go into production with an unfinished script and your writer abandoned you so he can go on strike. That's what happens when you make a movie with an unfinished script and it's up to the director to fill in the blanks. Oh, oh man. What a little wild franchise. It's moments. It, it, that whole movie was like a moment. When you think about it, Dune Part 2 was definitely the better of the two movies. I enjoyed it more. Like, this is, when I say, like, it's a, yeah. like, one of the few 10 out of 10 movies. Mm-hmm. No, it's the first 10 out of 10 movie I've seen all year. Because, like, you know, the IMAX definitely added to the experience, but even if I wasn't in IMAX, I would have greatly enjoyed this film. The music in, at the end, when, like, Chani is walking off into the desert, it plays like, yeah, we won, but at what cost? You know, like, you get that kind of vibe from it. Yeah, and and like what's to come, almost like what's yeah. to come of this holy war, because also there's another okay, there's another change that happens in this. Okay, you've seen David Lynch's version, right? Yeah, yeah. So Aaliyah kills uh, the Baron, not Paul. Yeah, it goes off into space and gets eaten by a worm when he like crashes back down to Arrakis. Yeah. It's... Uh, Aaliyah played a significantly bigger role in the plot of, like... She played a significantly bigger role in the last third of the book, but here she's literally a fetus, and she appears in Paul's like a crazy spider stream. Yes. <laughs> but... That's also a character that's been altered to sort of fit what Lulnerv is going for with his interpretation of Dune. It's just, I am I'm a little <clears throat> cautious because I... the next part is, the next part, uh, the next two books, I would say, are pretty hard to adapt. Like, intentionally hard to adapt because the level of exposition gets... It gets ramped up, and the level of weirdness, like the weird parts of the universe, because Dune doesn't have aliens; it just has humans that have been isolated for so long that they've become alien to one another. Yeah, you could see that. Like even with the Harkonnens, man, like they aren't alien; they're humanoid. They're just adapted to living on this harsh planet. Yeah, with like a black sun. And has like fucked up their skin in a lot of ways. Like they don't feel a shit. Yeah. It's the infrared scene was so sick though. Yeah. I love that shit, but like when the the fireworks went off, they went black and white and it was the it was kind of beautiful because like it wasn't like traditional fireworks. It was like I don't know, it it looked damn man, like the closest thing I could describe it to was like when you like drip a sample onto like the thing under a microscope and you see it like splatter. It it's like blobs of paint. Yeah. I mean, like, it's like paint. Just, like, yeah, like yeah. monochrome paint all over the sky. Like yeah. it really fit and I liked how the fireworks had these like flashes when Fade was walking down the hallway. It was like lightning flashing. But like it was, there were these explosions instead of like loud rumors, like boom, boom. As he walked down the hallway, it gave this like sense of foreboding, like something terrible is about to happen. But really, he's just gonna hook up with Leah Sado. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Margot Fenwick, um, that that he has read. Yeah. Um, and you know they hooked so, up because afterwards she was like touching her stomach and she was like, "The bloodline is secure." <laughs> Yeah. So the whole point of it's expanded off into the book, but basically they tried to do that with Paul and his family, and it doesn't work. Where they can establish control in a way with you, where like for for Fade Rafa, his triggers like what the Benny Jesuit really do, like. In order to gain control of a bloodline, they sexually imprint themselves onto you. Like that's what happened with Jessica and like Duke Plato. Like she imprinted herself onto him, which is why he never took a wife. And that's also another reason he never took a wife. Um, and because of how the Atreides are, it actually flipped the, the the dynamic where she just fell in love with him. And gave him the son. So that's when they realized, like, oh shit, the Atreides need to just be wiped out. We can't control this bloodline. They're gonna, they're gonna become a problem. So let's just get rid of them now. Yeah, it was. It really played in this thing of like, you often meet your destiny on the road you take to avoid it. Because, you know the. Banner Jesuit like told the Emperor, like, you know, this Atreides bloodline is out of control. You know, it's gonna you know, it's it's gonna come back to bite you in the ass sometime. And he tried to wipe them out. But ultimately it was him trying to wipe them out, which is what led to the thing coming back to bite him in the ass. Like bite him in the ass. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like the thing you fear will come back for you. Yeah. Oh shit, but yeah. That's he, yeah, he did it to himself. Raised it when you think about it. He did this to himself. If he had done nothing, nothing would have happened. No, he, I think he was still would have gotten fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the, because they were... They, so, the whole thing of what makes the Saruka, like the Emperor's army, so like strong is because they grew up on a harsh environment. So, the Saruka come from a planet where it's like constantly winter and it's a prison planet you go there because you get locked you, you get locked up and you get sent to die but in secret if you get sent there you're being trained to be part of this army and what makes him so resilient is the environment on the side of our planet is just fucked up and there'll just be random avalanches you have to be really tough to live there and arrakis is even worse to live in so like later recruiting all these people to like hey you know what like we're not like the, the Harkonnens we're not gonna like fuck you over we're just gonna you wanna come work with us that's basically his thing like you wanna come work with us and they would have just wrecked they would have wrecked the emperor eventually it wouldn't have happened as fast but it would have happened that's just my opinion yeah <clears throat> oh what a, <laughs> this is, like you said, speaking of like wrecking everything, there was um when they found that stockpile of like those nukes basically, and then they're like, How powerful is all this? And it's like powerful enough like to to blow up the entire planet and like still guard. Everyone was like, Wait, what? What did you say? He's like and they're like I, I, like I meant like meta like theoretically, man, like we're not really going to fill up the whole fucking planet. Like, chill, chill. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that scene over there was quite funny. Um, the law behind that is that atomics are completely out, um, not allowed in warfare. That's the rule of part of the Geneva Convention of the Great Houses is that everybody gets those 92 rockets and if one of them fires it's free for all you can you you can just start nuking shit so if those rockets are like a mutually assured destruction plan where if you use it everybody's allowed to use it now it's it's free game yeah because those are atomic weapons 
and they do not fall around. You saw a little that mountain. Mm-hmm. I mean, three of them to level that entire mountain. Yeah. So imagine, like, you still have like a 80 something left. That was that was like some awesome power. That definitely a real way would that change the face of warfare if like someone actually got a hold of those and started using them in battle. But like the um, uh, now that Paul has access to that like stockpile of weapons and the Fremen army, and like he's technically the new emperor, even though the other houses don't recognize that he's hell, he's basically like I said, you know, he's king of this shit now, man. Like he can essentially do whatever. The other houses, it's a you can feel like it's a case of you're either gonna bend the knee or you're gonna go down. Like, it's that easy. We have all these forces under our control already, and we have this power. There is no winning for you in this. The only way this ends is you die or you submit. Yeah. Yeah, he makes it very clear. Like, you either are gonna join me or you're gonna, you're gonna get crushed. Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. Oh man, a solid, hey, definitely a 10 out of 10 movie this was. I was never, in the hours I was sitting there, I didn't feel the hours passing by. There was never a moment where I'm like, this is dragging or anything, you know, like, it definitely felt, it was a, it was an entertaining film. I didn't particularly enjoy Paul being like, nah, man, I'm not, I'm not the one. Then Gurney that tells him like, "Come on, man! Even if you aren't, like, at least say you are, man. They'll listen to you." Like, "Nah, man, I'm not the one." And then he chugs some blue juice, and it's like, "I am 100% the one. Let's go. Let's get these motherfuckers." Like, just that. Like, I didn't. I wasn't feeling that, man. Like, just surely he could see. Like, even if he wasn't the one, even if he didn't believe it, they do, man. Like, that's what counts here. Whether you believe it or not is irrelevant. Just say you are. They'll buy it. Yeah, even 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 this little guy's like, I don't care what you believe. I believe. Yeah. I believe. Oh shit. Yeah, man. Just there was thing is, it really does remind me of the Matrix in a lot of ways. Because even in the Matrix, Neo did not believe he was the one. He, all the way until like the third act, he didn't buy it. The Oracle straight up, like, told him, like, not, like, he went to talk to the Oracle, and she didn't say exactly, you're not the one, but she said enough that he would think, like, so, wait, I'm not the one? He's like, like, sorry, he's like, sorry to hear that. And she didn't say, I'm sorry to tell it to you. She says, when he says, so, I'm not the one, he's like, sorry to hear that. Like, she's not agreeing with him, but she's not, like, shying away from that either. So that later, when he comes back, he's like, you told me exactly what I needed to hear, didn't you? I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, like, on call for that, I find this version of him to be a bit more compelling than the book. Because in the book, he immediately accepts, like, from the one, he is the one. Like, he just accepts it. And the reason I didn't like it is because... Didn't give the prescience of a value it's supposed to have when he ingests that water, because the the big theme of that when he when he's like talking to the he literally talks to the spirit of Jamis, the guy. Yeah, at the end. He's Not like, the end, but like before the like, battle. Yeah. Yeah, like you need to go to the high, highest vantage point. Like you can't see the future without seeing the past and when he unlocks those memories he realizes like i do need to be the one because there's something bigger at stake here there's something much bigger coming in the future like and it's and he's sitting there and it's genuinely like in the book it's a burden on him it's a burden on you like his spirit as a person and like for some context like in the future, there's a character that comes along who he fulfills a greater role than Paul. And every night, that guy would like he'd go out, he'd like do whatever he did, and he'd come back to his sister and he'd sit on, he'd, like putting his head on her lap and he'd be like, "Can you please talk to our mother 
I need to find a way to die because this can't be my whole life. Like it was so burdensome on him. And Paul is like, he is feeling that right now. Like maybe not at this moment where we see him, like he just started this jihad, but it's going to start pressing down against him and yeah. we'll see what happens to his character. There was like a big hesitation that they laid out on him because it's like, yo man, if he's seeing into the future and seeing like, you know, he says like billions die in my name. Like, he's like, man, I don't want this. I don't want, he's like, yeah, I want the revenge on the Harkins and shit, but I don't want billions of people dying for me. And in the movie, you can tell like he does get to a point where he's like, you can tell they were trying to say that he gets to a point where he understands like, yeah, billions will die in this holy war, but it's something that needs to happen to save like, like trillions more after that. But it, it comes across, in terms of delivery, it ends up coming across like, yeah, I know billions will die and I don't give a fuck anymore. Like, it just, it yeah. came across like that. Like, like that. yeah, it, it came across like he doesn't care anymore. Not that he accepts it, but it's like, I don't care anymore that a bunch of people are going to die. Like, you know, this is what's got to, it's just, it is what it is. Uh. And then that's like, that's obviously going to rub off. It's going to rub on people the whole way. That, that like lack of empathy or, or care for just the people that he's sending into the war and the people that he's subjugating to follow him. Like that, that part just... It's definitely going to create some friction, especially within the Fremens themselves. Like, obviously, like, the ones from the north are just going to be like, whoa, like, what are we actually doing here? We got rid of the Harkonnens, but isn't this a lot worse? Aren't we becoming the bad guys now? Yeah, there was... There is some of that in, you know, the movie, but, like, there was some of that in X-Men. There was some of that conversation in X-Men 97 when, um... Like, we watched... Are you watching X-Men 97? I've watched a few episodes, but I haven't really gotten into it. I've been watching it with friends, and we've been just talking shit over it. So, I haven't sat down and just, like, focused on it. So, it's on Netflix, right? Uh, no, it's on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. But, okay, I can just download it then. I don't have Disney+. Plus. Yeah. So, there was, um... Uh, I'll get to it. So, wait, it's kind of a spoiler, but do you want a spoiler? I mean... Yeah, I, I'm not really a big spoiler person. Ah, uh, cool. I, I'm more like how how it actually unfolds. That's what's interesting to me. So, there was this debate about like this thing of like you know the thing you said like like um damn we'll be are we like is this who we are now like are we no better than the people we're fighting when um Rogue apparently like she had Trask by the collar. And she was, like, saying something, and she, like, dropped him off the ledge to his death. I don't remember verbatim what they were talking about, but she, like, dropped him to his death. And, like, everyone saw that shit, like, what the hell? Like, like Nightcrawl was like, Rogue, what did you do? And, like, Wolverine was like, you know, he did, like, you know, did what we were all thinking about. Like, that was his attitude. Like, you know, she just did what we were all thinking. We all wanted to do. Whether we never admitted, like, we all wanted this dude dead. She just did it. And, like, Forge and them were like, is this who we are now? Like, are we no better than, you know, the people we're fighting? You know, we just, you know, we just killed the guy. But at the same time, there's the argument of, like, I'm, I'm kind of tired of seeing the hero being like, if I kill you, I'm no better than you. Like, that's not how that shit works. Damn. That's never how that shit works. Like, I'm just glad she did it, though. But, like, to see the reaction of, like, like, you killing him makes you no better than him. Like, this is Trask. Rogue killing one dude does not make her no better than Trask. He made the freaking Sentinels. Uh, it's putting a value on human life in a way that like supersedes everything else that if you kill this person then you are no better than them and I think that is fucked up it's like so if I kill Hitler 
does that make me as bad as Hitler? The fuck? <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't work. If you if you ever t- want to like see how fucked up somebody's ideology is of like how they think, you just take it to an nth point, and if it doesn't work there, then you see how stupid it is. Yeah. Like that whole like now now you are like trash. I'm like no, she's not. No fuck. <laughs> Trask killed hundreds. Trask is responsible for the deaths of mutants all over the world. She killed one dude. Just saying, killing, like, by saying you're no better than Trask, you're basically saying one human life equates to that of, like, hundreds of mutants all over the world who died because of Trask. And then you're literally betraying your own kind at that point. Yeah. You're like... With one shitty human, not even like, not even like it was a civilian or like a normal, like a good human being. It was Trask, who was a piece of shit. And you literally said, "Yeah, so we are all equal to Trask in this exchange." Yeah, really. Like honestly, man, I'm with Wolverine on this, man. She, they were all thinking it. They'll never admit it, but they all, they were all thinking it, man. Like we probably should take this dude down but like because of morals or whatever we won't do it so like i'm like she's you know she's okay in my book uh yeah yeah i can definitely agree with that it's plus it's not like it's not like they're suddenly gonna become the evil brotherhood and start taking out humans wholesale no it was just one dude man yeah yeah it was pretty much just one some people like that's, that's great. yeah wolverine understood this a long time ago man some people just gotta go yeah you can be the hero and save innocence but some people there are times where some people just gotta go yeah you know i'm looking at you batman I'm looking at you. <laughs> exactly fucking exactly that guy has got more people killed than any of the villains he's locked up just say it yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, I love that, um, like, if you want proof that Batman never really cared for Jason Todd, look at Ben Affleck's Batman. Because the Robin who died in the DCEU was Dick Grayson. And when that happened, he, he just quit. But in the main comics, when it was Jason who died, he just found another Robin and kept going. Yeah, he was like, ah, you know what, one's dead. Let's get another one in there. And it was great, too. Like, <laughs> you know what killed me, right? There was, there was this quote, I think it was from, like, a Batman comic or something. It was like, if you kill a murderer, <clears throat> and if you, if you kill a murderer, you haven't changed the number of murderers there are in the world. And I'm like, what? they can't. They just kill another murderer. <laughs> like, also, yes, you have. It's minus one. So, just say. Uh, no, it, it, I, get, it, it, I get what he's trying to say. He's like, if you kill one. him, you take his spot. But, like, like, no, dude. Like, if I keep going, I will change the number of murderers there are in the world. Like, Oh, that is an easy point to counter offer. Like, oh, you haven't changed the number of murderers. Like, I will if I keep going. <laughs> That's mad. Yeah. Uh, I never, honestly, man, like, Jason Todd Robin was like, like, Batman gave him a lot of crap. Let's be real. Batman gave Jason Todd a lot of crap because he wasn't dick. That's it. Yeah. Just because he wasn't dick. It was always like his golden child. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing with Damien, man. Like, he he mostly, he definitely gave him, like, a no slack. Solely on the basis of, like, man, I didn't want a fucking kid. Like, I already got a kid. Let's just, I don't need another one. But you're here, so may as well. Oh, shit. I have a kid. His name is Dick Grayson. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much what he said. Pretty much. 
Like, he's like, I remember, like, Damien Wayne in the one animated movie, he pulled a sword on a guy, and, like, that man stops him, and he's like, we don't kill people. Like, and he's like, that's like, you don't. Like, just, dude, he was raised by assassins, man. What are you coming in with this? Like, we don't kill people. Like, like, come on, man. Like, you don't, but, like, I do, man. Like, it, this is what I do, okay? Like, step back. <laughs> Speaking of Robins, like who, if you was booking like the DC universe, like and Batman, like Bruce Wayne was out of the picture, who do you think could step up and be a good Batman of the Robins? I think Dick Grayson has always been like the ideal choice because he he resonated with Bruce the most. Which in like if you're doing classic Batman, he is most likely to like wear the the mantle faithfully the other ones like damien i don't see damien wearing it well um i don't see like, like tim drake i have mixed feelings of tim tim drake is just a shit version of dick Grayson. yeah there's nothing so like in like indescribably different about the dude that i'm just like whoa you know he's like he's such a cool character and when he becomes but like honestly, red robin it's just like an amalgamation of red hood and robin it's not even his own thing yeah. like yeah exactly he, he's not even original in that sense the, um, the one i do want to see though and we have seen it is terry mcginnis like can i just have batman beyond already can we just do that? Yeah. I saw that uh that animated pitch that they were they pitched to WB and they turned it down. I remember seeing that and I'm like I was so mad dude. I was like, man, why the fuck would you show me something if I couldn't have it? Cause it, I read like, oh man, I saw like the video before I saw the tagline it was under. And I remember seeing like, oh, this is the pitch for the you know, Batman Beyond that they wanted to do with Warner Brothers. Like, oh, this is awesome. And then I read the whole thing. This is the cancelled pitch of the thing. I'm like, what the fuck would you show me this then? Like, if we couldn't have it. Why are you making me sad? Yeah, like, why are you making me sad? Yeah, like, dude. Like, they freaking animated the whole thing. If it was like, we have concept art, okay, I get it. They didn't like okay, it. Okay, that's fine. That's but cool. It's animated. That means you had concept art, you had like, you brought in artists and freaking animators and everything, and then you were like, actually, you know what? No. Just, what the hell? That's a bonehead decision on Warner Brothers' side. Like, they, I don't think they understand like how popular that character is. That aesthetic for Batman is so cool. The fact that Bruce Wayne is like, he is Alfred now. He's basically become Alfred. To be fair, it's been he's 20 like, years. I mean, by today's standards, to yeah. be fair, it's been 20 years since anyone last saw Terry McGinnis. In terms of, like, the animated series, yes. Yeah. But he's actually had a comic book run for quite a while now. Like, um, he, he had his own comic in, I think, around 2016, 2017. Like, and it was quite popular. I remember, like, a lot of people were like, holy shit, you know, like, Batman Beyond is so sick. And, um, like, that's when a lot of, like, the, the murmurs for a, like, Batman Beyond cartoon were coming around. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. We're, we're going to get the revival, baby. We're doing the run back season. Yeah. There were rumors circulating around uh, the time The Flash was coming soon. They said that, um... There was a rumor going around in WB. Like, it's from a source within WB, so they were like, depending on the success of the... Like, whether or not we get uh, Michael Keaton coming back as an older Batman and potentially doing a Batman Beyond movie will hinge on whether or not The Flash was a success. We all know how that turned out. Yeah, it, uh, it uh, turns out you put shit graphics behind something and... Uh... Uh, a pedophile weirdo is the main character. Uh, it, things go to shit. Things go to shit really fast. And you were right, the Flash did vanish. Mm. Yep. <laughs> that was exactly as they planned, planned it. Well, not, uh, you just know that was like a random date that someone thought of. 
having no idea that it would mean anything. And then like five years later, oh, the flash has vanished. No movies, no TV show, and now no toys. Just, it really has vanished. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, I, I don't find Barry Allen <clears throat> to be quite interesting, but I find the idea of there being a multiverse of Flash characters to be way more compelling. Like, you could do, like, a, you could do a mini-series with one from each universe, almost What If style, and you could have it, like, all connect together, and they have, like, a final showdown, some villain. That would have been so cool. That would have been so freaking cool. So you want him to do Spider-Verse stuff? Yeah, in a way. Like, the Flash Spider-Verse, would have, the Flash, like, like multiverse is honestly awesome. Like, from reading, from just reading, like, the offhand comic here and there about, like, the different Flashes of the different universes, it just it gets me excited in a way where it's, like, it's almost Spider-Man-esque. It's which is weird because you can tell like DC, like well the film division really wanted Blue Beetle to be their Spider Man, but uh, weirdly enough, the Flash has more in line with Spider Man than Blue Beetle ever did. Yeah, I think it, I think it's it's because Blue Beetle's target demographic and the people who enjoy Spider Man is pretty similar. I think that's why they thought that, but it's not the case at all. If that movie is anything to go by. How was that movie, by the way? I never ended up watching it. Me neither. I just remember seeing the box office, and it didn't bomb, but it drastically underperformed. Let's say that. It didn't bomb, but, you know, didn't light up the box office either. It was just so-so. Yeah, and I remember because James Gunn was like, oh yeah, Blue Beetle is going to be in the new DCU. This is not a DCEU movie. We are going to incorporate the character into the universe. This is where the DCU begins. They removed all the references to the DCEU so they could tie this character in. And then it underperformed, and then he promptly shut the fuck up about that. Honestly, his main job should be shutting the fuck up because he do be opening his mouth too much. Like, oh yeah, this is going to be where the universe starts, the movie doesn't pan out, and then he's like, Superman Legacy will be where the universe starts. <laughs> and then imagine Superman Legacy doesn't pan out. Like, hmm. And now our Batman 2, this is where the universe starts, and then like tied up in a closet is, is what's the director for Batman? I forget his name. Wasn't Andy Muschietti? Oh, wait, Matt Reeves. You mean Matt Reeves? Matt Reeves. Matt Reeves is tied up in a closet just like, you know, with a gag on his mouth. Like, no! No! Dude, like, I just... I do not get this dude, man. Like, can't you see that Robert Pattinson Batman is doing his own thing? Leave him. Let him do his own thing. Don't shoehorn him into your universe. Just leave him, man. Uh, and he doesn't even fit, he won't even fit into another, like, DCEU, like, type universe. It doesn't make sense. Especially when you could remember that in his, uh, his phase one of the DC universe, that James Gunn said that Batman, Brave and the Bold, is what they'll be adapting in, um, the Batman movie that's coming in the f next few years. That movie has Damian Wayne in it, apparently. So, does Pattinson look like the kind of guy who has a kid running around? Just... No. Exactly. He just no. met Catwoman, man. Like, he ain't gonna be out here with Taya or Ghoul in there. Sorry, what? Yeah. I, I don't think... People who did the first few phases of the MCU deeply understood the material and 
understood how to interlock it quite well. And there was a cohesive theme throughout. And the reason I appreciate that, although I didn't like it near the end, because it felt like you were getting the same same peanut butter and jelly sandwich every time, but just different bread. It just... And then, and then the Batman comes out, and it's so stylistically different to everything being produced at this time. Yeah. And then now somebody he wants to homogenize it again like you know what they should have done DC should have understood like your strength isn't to be like Marvel don't be Marvel do your own thing like put them in isolated universes that would have been the best thing to do give a director say hey listen you like a director that's like a big fan of the material obviously we don't want David lynching to happen and um you give them the material, you tell them, hey, listen, you're running with this character. How do you want to style it? How do you want to do it? And we'll do the marketing or, and, you know, pay the bills. Done. Yeah. Yeah, oh. but they wanted to be a because they saw a cash cow without understanding that there's mechanics to achieving that cash cow. Yeah. So put you remember all that That's weird what you marketing? You remember the Flash had that weird old marketing of like Tom Cruise was like, I've seen it and it's one of the best movies ever. David Zaslav was like, I've seen it and it's one of the best movies ever. James Gunn was like, I've seen it. It's one of the best movies ever. I'm like, are you, <laughs> are you kidding me, man? Like, what is going on here? Is this what you call marketing? A bunch of famous people coming out of nowhere saying like, yeah, I've seen it. It's awesome. Like, how the hell is Tom Cruise in on this going, this is like, you know, one of the best movies ever made. People are like, and then WB was like, we've had test screenings and like, they haven't been this positive since the Dark Knight. Like, really? Do <laughs> you expect me to believe that? No. <laughs> and so Scientology told him to do it. That's why. <laughs> oh, uh, I still laugh at the we haven't had reactions like this since Dark Nights. <laughs> I think you see the empty cinema. There's like three dudes in it. They're like, yeah, Flash. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, granted, I did enjoy myself. You know, like, the movie had a surprising amount of heart when it came to Barry and his mom. But, like, the best thing yeah. since Dark Knight. Mm, no. Nah. No. If you were like best thing since Batman and Robin, I would be like, okay, I see it. You know, like I kind of see that. But like Dark Knight, really? No, man. No, no, no. Oh, crap, shoot, man. That movie, they were, that, I think I, Molly said it best. Like they were truly screwed when it came to that movie because that movie was burning a hole in their pocket because that initial release date. They couldn't release it during that initial release date because Ezra Miller was going through all that crap. But they couldn't cancel it either because they had spent way too much money making it. So all they could do was postpone, postpone, hope the heat dies down. Oh, uh, shoot. That was... Yeah. Yeah, that movie was... If that movie had come out on the initial 2019 release date, it would have been fine. You know, it would have been fine. Because it was before all this stuff. It would have been just fine. But, like, delays and, you know, script changes and them not knowing what direction they want to go in really messed it all up. By the time it finally finished, now the star is getting hunted by the police. He's getting locked up. He can't do press for his own movie. We also can't cut him from the movie because he's in, like, 90% of the footage. So... Uh, yeah, they were. He's a menace to society. Yes, he's a freaking menace. Like, damn, dude. Like, we can't put him in any of the posters. And in any of the posters we he's already in, he has to wear a mask. Cause... <laughs> oh, dude. This was a disaster, man. Like, this whole movie. The movie isn't that interesting, but the events leading to it surely are. Like, can we get a documentary on this? I'd watch that. Yeah. <laughs> The Ezra file needs to be in a flash. Oh, shit. 
Damn, man. See you in a flash. Coming in 2025. I mean, whenever the hell Ezra Miller gets out of jail. <laughs> Damn, bro. Damn, I, I paid money for that Netflix documentary. Mm. Damn, no, man. Like, just... Oof. That was a weird manhunt. Let's just be real. Like, the Ezra Miller manhunt was weird. It was like, because the police were like, we can't find him. We have no idea where he is. And dude is like live streaming and like, you know, making these random social media posts all over the place. And they're like, he attacked someone in a bar in Hawaii. And he like, he broke into someone's house to steal beer. Like, what? <laughs> you Ain't you like rich, man? I'm like, I'm just thinking, when I heard that, I was like, Ain't you rich? Can't you just go into a store and buy beer? What were you breaking into people's houses for? Minister <laughs> society. Dude, like, he's got, like, there was a thing where, like, he has guns on his, like, what is it, alpaca farm or something? And there's, like, photos of kids playing with bullets. I was thinking, what the hell? How have you not caught him? He's literally, like, posting shit, showing where he is. What are y'all doing? Like... <laughs> it's like the most incompetent crook, but also even more incompetent police are chasing him. Dude, like, like, I don't know. Maybe, I can't compare it to anything. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the cops from the Naked Gun movies with, like, Leslie Nielsen, but, like, even they caught the crook at the end, man. Like, like. And Ezra Miller was still at the lodge. Dude, like, there's nothing to compare it to because there's no police force, fictional or not, that was that bad. Like, bruh. These are real cops. Yeah, man. Shit. But anyway, man, like, uh, all that to one side. All that far into one side. Um. WB is in a weird place, man. With all the stuff going on, they're in a weird, like, state of flux. Ugh. Why so? Well, because I'm dude. Keep you the news. Well, uh. Well, considering the fact that WB are the studio that produced the the Dune Bay movie, well, they didn't make Dune. Denis Villeneuve and a bunch of other studios that he was working with. No, it was Denis Villeneuve and another studio. They worked to make the movie. Huh? Was what? it legendary? Yeah, 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 it was them. They actually made the movie, and WB was, like, in charge of, like, distribution. They have the distribution rights. They are no longer working together. Legendary Pictures and WB, the contract they has is done. So if they do yeah. do in three... It won't be WB shutting it out, so it's just okay. Yeah. That's why I'm like they're in a weird place because they got all this money coming in from Dune too, but they know damn well like the next Dune. That cash gonna, cow's gone. Yeah, that cash cow's gone. So yeah, there's that, and their DC universe is in freaking limbo because there's no movies being. Well, there's movies in production, but there's nothing in cinemas right now. And what else they got? Oh, yeah, Harry Potter hasn't had a good movie since fucking Harry Potter was in it. So, yeah, yeah it's Fantastic just... Fantastic beast. And no. why not to see it? Yes. Fantastic movie. Uh, dude. Well, that was... That first one, I was like, okay... That was it was okay. I don't need to see more of that, but it was an okay movie. And then they did two more, and they were so boring. I don't care about wizard politics, okay? I don't care about who's voting for who in the tri wizard parliament or what the fuck ever. I do not care. Like just and yet that's the whole movie. This dude trying yeah. to win an election. Like why? Why? We used to have, like, so many cool things, and we were boiling down to wizard politics. Like, yeah. Uh, 
whatever. Moving on. Um, damn, what else does WB have? Not a lot when you think about it, because they, they don't they don't have a lot of big franchises to their name anymore. Because they've mostly been Batman and you know Harry Potter and whatnot. Lord of the Rings. Oh, forgot Lord of the Rings. They they still have Lord of the Rings. Wait, no, they don't. Amazon as Lord of the Rings. They had that Rings of Power show. So, oh, that's toast. Um, they got Game of Thrones. You know, House of the Dragon. There's there's that. You know. They don't have much going on for them. Yeah, yeah they don't have much going on. That's what I'm like. They're in a weird place. Oh, I can't even sit here and be like, oh, poor WB. Like, not really. I mean, make your bed, you gotta lie in it, so... Not really. Yeah. Oh. Ah, suck it, Warner Brothers. Like, Zack Snyder was right. Suck it, Warner Brothers. You guys just a bitch. Yeah. But, you know, I'm... I mean, if... I'm not gonna ever say that on a public forum or anything. Last time I did, weirdly enough, we got copyright struck. I can you believe that shit? I kid you. I kid you not, man. Like there was there was an episode years ago because it was like we it was 2021 and it was fresh because Justice League the Snyder Cut had come out and you know I we we just heard like Zack Snyder say for the first time, "Suck it, Warner Brothers," and I said it. And the thumbnail was all this WB stuff. And right across the whole thing, in big green writing, was hashtag suck it, Warner Brothers. Even in the title said, suck it, Warner Brothers. And, like, not even an hour later, after I got, like, one view, it said, this video has been... <laughs> I, was, I saw it, I'm like, wait, what? By who? And then it was from, it was WB. What the actual fuck? Dude, <laughs> I was yep. so I was so shocked, man. Like, what the hell? What happened? <laughs> I had to change everything. I like I changed the thumbnail. I changed the title. I had to cut out the WB stuff. It was like five seconds, really. It was just five seconds of us saying "suck it," and then I uploaded it again, and it was it was fine. Like, are you kidding me? Do you are your petty asses kidding me, man? Yeah, they're for real. Some yeah. Heavy, heavy motherfuckers. Like, dude, I, I couldn't believe this shit. I'm like, you're telling me this big ass, multi billion dollar corporation can't take little old me telling them to suck it? Like, like wow. Just. Yep. yep. I mean, the first time I got copyright struck on a YouTube thing, I was kind of flattered because. Like, all oh, this major corporation saw my shit. Like, this is this is a big win for me, personally. But, like, at the same time, I understood. I understood why I was being copyright struck, because I did have footage from one of their things. So I took that video down. But this is just petty, man. Like, man. Uh, like, I can't even say suck it anymore. Damn. Whatever. Moving on. It didn't imply anything, but like, cause like I remember the next episode, cause like we met at that Starbucks. I we did I didn't say suck at Warner Brothers at the time. I was like, man, fuck Warner Brothers, like just <laughs> copyright strike that motherfucker. Yeah, like there's no, yeah. How I dare you? Like go ahead, copyright strike me, telling you to go fuck yourself. Copyright that. Like you'll just be like, you know, I won't. I can't really say they'll be giving me views because the video would be blocked, but still, you know, you'll be proving my point, basically. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, man. Oh, what a world. What a world. Yeah. Isn't what a wonderful world this will be. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>